the what the infinite banking concept really allows you to do is to have your capital doing multiple jobs at one time. And so thinking about it like this, I can either use cash from a checking or savings account to, to accommodate this function of having to have capital for, to run this real estate business. And as soon as I take that money and trade it for the repairs on this house or the down payment or whatever it may be, that cash no longer has the opportunity to grow. It's yeah. simply gone. You know, think about it like a stair step. Like I put money into a bank account and then all of a sudden I need it for that repair. Boom, it goes to zero and that cash has to be deployed outside of the bank. In, the, in, the, in a cash value life insurance policy, why we use that as a vehicle is because the cash actually doesn't ever get taken out of your policy. It just acts as collateral in which I can borrow against to go and accommodate that need for capital, but my cash continues to grow in a compounding uh, fashion for the rest of my life. Welcome to Racking Up Rentals, a show about how regular people, those of us without huge war chests of capital or insider connections, can build lasting wealth acquiring a portfolio of buy and hold real estate. But we don't just go mainstream looking at what's on the market and asking banks for loans, nor are we posting we buy houses signs or just looking for quote, motivated sellers to make lowball offers to. You see, we are people oriented deal makers. We sit down directly with sellers to work out win-win deals without agents or any other obstacles and buy properties nobody else even knows are for sale. I'm Jeff from The Thoughtful Real Estate Entrepreneur. If you're the kind of real estate investor who wants long-term wealth, not get-rich-quick gimmicks or pictures of yourself holding fat checks on social media, this show is for you. Join me and quietly become the wealthiest person on your block. Now let's go rack up a rental portfolio. Hey, thank you for joining me for another episode of Racking Up Rentals. Show notes for this episode, including a complete transcription of the awesome interview you're about to hear, are going to be at thoughtfulre.com slash E57 for episode 57. Hey, please do us a big favor by hitting the subscribe button in the podcast app. It really helps other people find us and uh, we'll make sure, of course, that you do not miss the next episode as well. So onward with today's episode. And in today's episode, I'm really pleased to bring you a really cool, uh, fun and informative interview with Russ Morgan and Joey Murray from Wealth Without Wall Street. Now, these two guys in Wealth Without Wall Street, they have a podcast, they've got a, an online community, they've got all sorts of educational programs, and they are, as their name suggests, advocates of building your financial independence without going down the traditional route of stocks and bonds and retirement plans and all the kind of Wall Street sort of stuff. So they're fans of real estate and they're fans of different financial tools, one of which is a financial tool referred to as infinite banking. Yes, infinite banking. It's an intriguing name in and of itself. And in this episode, you are going to learn not just about Joey and about Russ and how they got their business started and what their focus is. You're going to learn about their community they've got. They're going to learn about a special offer that they've made just for us. And you're going to learn about infinite banking and what a cool tool it can be and how it can apply in your real estate entrepreneurship business. So without further ado, here's my interview with Russ and Joey from Wealth Without Wall Street. All right, guys, welcome to Racking Up Rentals. I appreciate you being here. Yeah, we're glad to be here, man. Thanks for having us. Yeah, Jeff, thanks for having us on. It's really cool that we got to kind of meet virtually through a different event a couple of weeks back, and I'm glad we were able to connect to make this happen. Yeah, me too. I'm, I'm grateful that you're interested in uh, chatting and sharing your message with our audience. So can you just kind of give us a, a quick intro? Who are the two of you individually, and then who are the two of you together? Well, I'll start off. So my name is Joey Murray, and on our show, I'm called the Italian Stallion, uh, just because I was um, grateful enough to be brought into this world from Sicilian descent and uh, uh, came over on the boat. I didn't personally come over on the boat, uh, but my family did. And um, Russ and I actually met back in 2008, 2009. We were going to church together, and in, I was in the mortgage business at the time. And he simply came to me one day and he's like, hey, I want to start sending you referrals. Well, I mean, if you're in any sort of 
commission-based sales, you say, yes, sir, I'll show up for lunch. Then he said, hey, by the way, you need to read this book if I'm ever going to send you any referrals, and it's going to be $20. And I'm like, dude, that's kind of low budget. Like, usually someone wants to sit, give you a book, they give it to you. They don't charge you $20. I mean. Well, but I, I in fairness, Jeff, I didn't know if he would actually read it. So like, I didn't <laughs> want to be out any money if he did. <laughs> yeah, he's hedging his, uh, hedging his bets there on me. But that book actually changed my life and dramatically changed the way I think, um, which is more important than that, about money and finance. It was actually the thing I had been looking for uh, for my own personal family. Fast forward four years later, after implementing a lot of the things from that book and what Russ had to tell me and share with me and coach me on, and I was so overwhelmed with um, really being compelled that, man, more people need to know the same stuff. They need to know that there's an alternative to the way they've been taught about finances. And there's just not enough people out there doing this. And um, so I came home from this conference. I was all fired up. My wife is at home with, uh, she's pregnant with our fourth daughter at the time. I now have five daughters, but at that time, four, on, one on, or fourth on the way. And, uh, you know, I'm going through, my, I'm like rehearsing this in my brain. Like, okay, I'm about to tell her I'm going to give up this 300,000 plus career, a $300,000 a year career, leading mortgage loan officers all over uh, Birmingham. And we're going to start a business from scratch with Russ. And I'm just thinking, what is she going to be doing here? Like, is she going to be like, get out of my house, you're a moron? Like, what, what are you talking about? Like, why would we ever do something so stupid? And so I, I kind of get up the courage. I go to her. I say, Jess, I feel like I'm supposed to do this. I'm supposed to start this business with Russ. And you know what she said? She said, you absolutely should do that. And I was like blown away and immediately knew that it was meant to be. And that was 2014. Fast forward um, to today. Now we have a thriving national business and uh, are able to share this message on a much, much bigger stage than I ever thought possible. Yeah. Wow. Awesome. Isn't, isn't that great? Like basically you said, Jeff, that I'm his hero. <laughs> I, I changed his life. I get, I, by, by making him invest in himself, by putting $20, you know, up, because the cheapskate, if I would have given it to him, he probably wouldn't have read that book. And by the way, the book is called Becoming Your Own Banker. I don't know if that's a question that you have. but that, well, I was wondering if we were just going to be left in, in yeah. suspense and torture. Like, <laughs> I always forget that detail. Yeah, but it's it, it was a, something actually, you know, so my, my story, I was, uh, I'm married now with four kids, and I, I was a typical certified financial planner, helping people separate themselves from their money, and I was making a good living doing it. And the market crashed in 08. And I'm one of those that really like to be in control, like most people. But, you know, if, if we're going to go on a car ride, I'm going to be the one driving, right? You know, if we're going to play golf, I'm going to be the one, you know, behind the wheel. <laughs> and when the market crashed and I was sitting there controlling everyone's money, supposedly, I was really a money babysitter, but I thought I was controlling the money. I realized, man, this is not for me. Like, I, I didn't like the feeling of having to tell people, hey, you only lost 30%. Feel good because everybody else lost 50 And I just happened to be at this conference at, I think a theme here. We met at a conference. Joey went to this event and, and had, a, had a change of life at a conference. But I was at this event and I, I met this man who at the time was in his late seventies. He wrote this book called Becoming Your Own Banker. And the whole concept was you need to invest in yourself. You need to put your cash in your own hands. Don't give it away. The financial golden rule, right? Those who have the gold make the rules. And once you, once you do that, invest in things that you understand and that you can influence the outcome of, and through that, you can actually build true wealth. And it just made so much more sense to me because I was like, that seems simple. And there was a lot of things in there was contrary to my, you know, my, my professional like training, but it made sense. And so I started sharing that message. And as Joey said, it, it ultimately made me like disavow everything that I'd learned and like, I helped us create a business and company called Wealth Without Wall Street. <laughs> it's something that it, it definitely flies in the face of conventional wisdom, if you will. But for most of the people like yourself, and I'm sure maybe the person listening to us now, that when you're you're seeking true financial wealth, it comes in the form of cash flow and it comes in the form of things that are based upon things that we can influence and we can find properties, right? We can help negotiate the deals on those properties. We can 
help uh, navigate who's going to be inside of our rental properties. And we have the ability to determine uh, how long we're going to let them be there. And, and from that standpoint, we, we stay in control. And I love that. And so that's what's allowed us from, you know, back when Joey and I started, uh, started this business back in 2005, we left this typical financial planning company that I was at to, to do this. And as Joey said, we started a podcast, Wealth Without Wall Street, and then started just working, working virtually uh, with people uh, since then. Yeah, that is awesome. Well, you know, when, when we met, uh, or when I was watching you on screen, I should say, when you were, you were presenting, right. The two things that really attracted me to you is at first I thought I, this is going to sound real new agey, but I thought like you guys had a, a vibe that I felt kind of was aligned with kind of what we have here, you know, in this community that I've got and thoughtful vibe and just, just a little chill and laid back and, and intentional, but like just approachable. And I really like that. So I wanted to spend more time with you. But then the other thing was just simply this idea that um, you can do things in an alternative way. And, and I, you know, I don't guess I don't use this turn of phrase, uh, you know, real estate without banks, but that is effectively what we're talking about or acquisitions without realtors. It, that is what we're talking about too. So I really felt this kind of affinity with you guys for saying, hey, let's just step back and let's maybe question some assumptions about what we have to do and what paths might be available to us to accomplish the things we are trying to accomplish. Well, and I, I, I like what you're saying because um, birds of a feather kind of flock together. We're uncommon people, ultimately at our core. If you're an entrepreneur, especially if you're in a real estate entrepreneur, you already know that there's something not quite the same as everybody else around you. So you have to find your people. You have to find your tribe. And um, so I'm excited to be able to share uh, back and forth with one another, this community that you've built on uh, on a great show. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So, you know, I've, I was not aware of you until I met you sort of a few weeks ago, but then since then I've been able to listen to some podcast episodes and check out your community and just start to understand, you know, your platform a little bit. So can you tell us what is kind of like your framework for helping people achieve financial independence? I think I've seen, you've got kind of a four-step process. Can you walk us through that overall? Yeah, totally. So we, we look at how to create freedom with a really simple formula. And it, unless you're driving, write this down and you may already know this formula, but some people don't, they don't really, they, they don't know that they, they actually can determine how close they are to this freedom point. And on the left side of your page, write passive income. So all the rentals that you have or e-commerce business that you have, whatever it is, any income coming in that you're not actively going to work for, put that on the left side. And then on the right side, take your monthly expenses, whatever your average monthly expenses are. And if you don't know what those are, that's a problem. You need to fix that. But get those numbers and you can divide the left number into the right number. And as a percentage, it will tell you how close you are to financial freedom. And that's obviously something that we've all learned through Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, Poor Dad concept, passive income greater than monthly expenses equals freedom. It doesn't equal $5 million or $10 million or whatever the number is. Sometimes we're, we're taught by the commercials. And so what Joey and I have done inside of our community, it's teach a four-step process to how do we not only get to that point, but then how do we cherish the life that we've built? And so our first step is clarity. And we teach a master class on this and we're helping people like understand like this process. And we, we're actually going through, we're spending several hours and, and weeks on just understanding what is it that we want? Why do we want it? And then how does that measure up to what we're doing today? And I think there's a lot of things in our life that we, we, we get really excited about and we go run after, but we don't spend a whole lot of time planning it out. And, and that's, a, that's a problem, right? I mean, it's just getting in the car and driving without knowing where you're going. And so our first step is clarity. And, and we, we use that measuring stick I shared with you a second ago. We call it a financial scorecard where we have people put what is their passive income, have them go through all their monthly expenses and put it in there. And then it spits it out and it, it shows it to them. And so they, they see where they are and they can measure against it uh, on, a, on a daily or monthly basis. And from there, we talk about like, well, how do we impact those two numbers, right? So the left number uh, is the passive income. That's the thing we're usually most excited about. But to be honest, that's the thing that probably we need to hold off initially. We need to figure out the right side of the page. We need to figure out wh where are our dollars currently going to. 
not that Joey and I ever want to help people reduce their lifestyle. It's actually quite the contrary. We, we teach a lot of strategies like 401 lake houses versus 401 caves. We talk a lot <laughs> about like enjoying the life with our families now when they're little, but they're not going to be little again. So yeah, you can take your kid to Disney when they're 45, but it won't be quite the same experience <laughs> with them riding on your shoulders. You may actually be in reverse on that. So we, we, we love, though, looking at where our dollars are going and talking about maybe some ways that we might have been taught up to that point um, that may not be the best ways to help us reduce expenses, reduce taxes, reduce debts. And so we do a lot of training in that. And our step two is called control. And, and so controlling where our dollars are going. And, and once those dollars are put in, a, uh, in our control, we know where they're going and we have excess dollars, right? We better have money left over at the end of the month. We, we teach how to actually implement that, that becoming your own banker book that I was referring to and Joey mentioned earlier on that changed his life. And, and that point, once we got kind of the right side of the page and our, our cash in an opportunity fund that we can take action, that leads us to step three and four. Yeah. And so I'll, I'll pick up there. Step three is um, creating a course, right? And the course really applies to which passive income course are you going to go down? And we, we start with one, what's your current makeup? So we have, I don't know if you've ever heard of the DISC uh, assessment. Yeah. You know, most people have taken one uh, at some point or another. And what we've done, and we, we worked with the guys at DISC to create an investor DNA, we call, where it really highlights your own, like using your DISC profile to highlight which sort of investment path may align most with you. And so once you know that, then you can start saying, okay, maybe I'm interested in this land flipping business that I can start as a side hustle, grow it into a, a place to replace my income, and then eventually make it a passive business that has now created more freedom with my time. Or maybe it is long-term rentals, as you're talking about on your show um, maybe it's through multifamily or residential. You start to figure out which of those courses aligns with one, who you are, and two, goes back to that clarity piece, which means, do I want a business that I can work full time in that aligns more with who I am? Or do I want literally it to be running on autopilot and I maybe have to check in on it a couple hours a day or a couple hours a week? Those things are all going to, once you're clear on that, now you know what course to go down. And as Russ mentioned, our fourth step is cherish. Cherish the life that you've created. Now, part of that is just slowing down, breathing, and realizing what you've done uh, in the amount of time that we were, were setting out to do it. And maybe it takes you three years. Maybe it takes you eight years to get there. Uh, but you can look back and say, wow, look what we've done. Now you can also start looking at um, some different tax strategies that maybe will help optimize that income. Maybe it's now looking at legacy plans that you can say, how can I make sure that my assets and the knowledge I've created or, or taken in is passed to the next generation the most efficiently? Um, all those things are part of that last step and uh, will you know, truly help people get to financial freedom. Yeah. Ah, oh, that's such a great, uh, a great framework. You know, that I'm just struck by how much intentionality is is in there. You know, it's sort of like somebody saying, "I'm not just going to like jump in the river of life and let the current take me where it's going to take me. I'm I'm actually going to steer this how I want to. I'm going to enjoy the journey as well." Um, so I think that that I I really love that. And then I, it's very specifically the investor DNA thing is is so is so cool. I think because one of the things I feel like, even when I look at my own story, but then as I look at other people who are, who may be kind of like flailing around trying to find the thing that clicks for them is um, authenticity and fit between what you're trying to do and who you really are. And I think that like, when I just think about my own story, I was, you know, reading, uh, learning, and I'm like, I'm going to go apply this stuff because this is what is supposed to work. Little did I know, though, that it was really grating against me and kind of who I am naturally or my, my personality, my strengths, my, you know, whatever, my ethics, my standards, whatever it is. And it wasn't until I finally got things into an alignment between what I was doing and who I really am that I ever made any meaningful progress. And I, so I, I just love that idea of the investor DNA as being such an important part of that. 
Well, and I, I think that what Russ mentioned earlier is a lot of people want to jump to what's my passive income strategy because they get really excited about the idea of financial freedom, right? Which is awesome. I, I mean, we want people to be excited. It's, it's going to move us and compel us to take action. But sometimes we take the first step towards what the passive income idea is and we take little uh, thought process about who we are and what we actually want our outcome to be. And so a lot of times, like you said, we do get into something that goes against who we are or two creates a business that we really don't want to be in, but we didn't think about, you know, what it would be like essentially bringing the future to the present. And we're like, wait a minute, that's not what I want. So you're building towards something that you never would have signed up for had you known what the future looked like. And so I think that's why that first step of clarity is ridiculously important and very few people ever stop and and go through it. Yeah. What would you add to that, Russ? No, I agree. I think the more clear you are on things, the less stress you have. And as we talk about money, stress is a huge uh, problem that most people have in their life. And it's mostly related to money, right? I mean, we're in, talking about potential lockdowns, current lockdowns that are happening in our economy again from COVID. And that creates stress. And the biggest stress is the unknown, right? And so the more clarity we can add to our life, the, re- the more we can reduce stress. And that has to happen from us starting with that beginning uh, plan in mind of what is it that we really want and then measuring our time against that. Because a lot of times, and we talked about this, I think when we were at the event uh, that, that you heard us speak at, is a lot of times we, we seek financial freedom for the purpose of more time. Yet, how many people do you know actually are tracking their time? (laughs) Very few. I mean, there's lots of books. There's hundreds of books, thousands of books written on time management. It's the one thing that nobody wants to do, but everybody wants. And it's the one thing that we can't spend money to get more of. So we don't track the one thing that we really want. And and we, we talk a lot about that in our clarity piece that we need to be tracking our time. We need to understand is are we getting closer to what we want? Is it, are the activities that we do are, are doing, are they more focused or the, the things that we're living out? Are they more congruent with what we want or are they wasted activities? Are they maybe dissonant in relationship to what our ultimate uh, day would look like if we were, we were re- writing it out. And so we, we challenge our, our students to go through and look at their life and their time so that they can actually get back and get more of what they really have said was important to them. Yeah. Oh, what you just described there is, it is just an intrinsic part of the definition of being thoughtful. So I, I, that resonates so strongly with me. I know well for everybody listening too. So one of the main ideas, you know, that's central, obviously just to the, the genesis of your business. And then obviously now to the tool set of stuff you're teaching is, is infinite banking. And I know there's a lot of people listening going, all right, what in the world is infinite banking? So can you give us a, an idea of what does that mean? Yeah, I will. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit of story on this. So I, I mentioned, Jeff, that my background was a certified financial planner. And my job was to help people manage money. And so my father-in-law, my wife's dad, his father passed away. His, his dad was a bank president in a little town in Kansas, and the bank that he was a man, uh, president of for many years was bought by Bank of America right before he retired. And when he died, he passed along a, a seven-figure um, amount of inheritance to my father-in-law, and it was all in the form of Bank of America stock. And so my father-in-law comes to me, and it's 2006-ish, and he says, okay, Russ, this is the money. Like they didn't have a lot of money and now they have a lot of money, right? In, in relationship to where they had been. And he's like, you know, my father told me never to sell this. Like it pays a great dividend. Just, I just want to protect it. And I was like, okay, well, you know, my training tells me that we should take this stock. We should put a stop loss on it, which means that if it falls below a per- certain percentage, then it should sell and that protects it. Okay. So that's a good thing. And he's like, I don't want to sell it. I was like, well, let's put it at 15%. Like it's never fallen that like, you know, in the history of the time we were like, like at 15%, that it had never happened. It had been pretty steady at $50 a share for the last couple of years. I was like, it's not a big issue. It's not going to fall that long. And I, it probably wasn't nine months later that stop loss got triggered. <laughs> the stock started falling. 
By the way, it fell, and as soon as it sold 100% of over 2,000 shares of stock, I get a phone call. What have you done? <laughs> You've sold the one thing that my dad said never to sell. And I, I was kind of the, uh, the black sheep of the family there for a few days. But as we didn't know at the time, we were the financial institutions were at the front edge of that, you know, great recession that was happening. And that stock ultimately fell and bottomed somewhere around five or six dollars a share. So to give you a little context, it went from a, it would have been a seven figure situation down to about 20,000. <laughs> That's what he would have had had we not sold it. So uh, I, I obviously uh, was liked from that point forward. But just like everybody, he was scared. He didn't know what to do with his money. And so what did we do? We just left it sitting in cash. And, and the markets are kind of going crazy. Well, my wife decides, she finishes dental school in 2006. She goes to work with another dentist for a little bit, decides to open up a dental practice right at the end of 2008. Great time to start a business, right? <laughs> we were financial geniuses. Well, what does she do? She goes and, you know, gets a business loan from Bank of America, one of the leading dental lenders in the, in the country. And in January 2009, I'm reading this book, Becoming Your Own Banker, after I'm leaving that conference. And he's talking about how people deposit money in banks, my father-in-law, right? It's, you know, a million dollars plus sitting in a, in a checking account. And then there's people that go to those same banks and borrow money from them and pay them interest. Now, whose money do they borrow? They, they borrow the depositor's money, not the bank's money. They borrow the depositor's money, and the bank makes a good living doing it. And I, and I was just sitting there looking at the two scenarios, my father-in-law with a million dollars plus sitting in a checking account earning nothing, my wife with a $700,000 um, loan from the same bank, Bank of America, paying almost 8%. And I thought, man, I, I'm not smart. You know, I, I went to a, a state school here in Alabama, Auburn University, and <laughs> but I can even put those two things together. So if if I apply the principles of what this book is talking about, why shouldn't my father-in-law take the money out of this checking account, lend it to my wife's business, and have her business pay him back the $8,000 a month for the next 15 years? Made sense to me. And I, I went and shared that idea with him, shared the book. And for about 10 years, that's what they did. They it, he he basically put the money in a dividend paying life insurance policy. That was one of the tools that was used in the book because that was where the banks kept their money. Joey worked at Wells Fargo. So when I was convincing him of this idea and why it was a good idea, I said, look, the bank you work at has over $18 billion in cash value life insurance. Uh, you know, they obviously know a lot about money and they're doing this. And he goes, oh, really? I didn't know that. <laughs> that was shocking. And, and I was like, you know, and by the way, Bank of America, the, the stock that my, my father-in-law has sold us that they've actually got $20 billion in cash value life insurance. So probably a good place for your money as well. And so we, we started doing that. We put the money there. We lent it to my wife's business and she started paying you back $8,000 a month. And then, and then we just started looking for other avenues, other things that we could do. So we bought some other different real estate investments. We bought some land together. There were some other businesses that we've done together where he lent from those insurance policies, the cash value that's in there. I don't know if people know much about it, but you could borrow against insurance companies uh, cash values. And, and we would go and invest in something. And obviously not, not all of them were profitable. Most of them were, and we would take those profits and we would repay the insurance company and just build our wealth. And so we, we were using this really uh, simple concept called infinite banking. And I, I love the way that those two things worked and it's just been a huge blessing in our own personal families. And, and so we've just continued to share it from there. And the only other thing I would um, add to that, Jeff is, when we're thinking about like your strategy of long-term rentals, in some cases, you probably don't need a whole lot of capital if you're taking over an owner financing note or, or whatever it may be. But a lot of times you do have to have some working capital in a form of a down payment or, you know, what repairs or whatever it may be. And the, what the infinite banking concept really allows you to do is to have your capital doing multiple jobs at one time. And so thinking about it like this, I can either use cash from a checking or savings account to, to accommodate this function of having to have capital for, to run this real estate business. And as soon as I take that money and trade it for the repairs on this house or the down payment or whatever it may be, that cash no longer has the opportunity to grow. It's yeah. simply gone. You know, think about it like a stair step. Like I put money into a bank account and then all of a sudden I need it for that repair. 
boom, it goes to zero, and that cash has to be deployed outside of the bank. In, the, in, the, in a cash value life insurance policy, why we use that as a vehicle is because the cash actually doesn't ever get taken out of your policy. It just acts as collateral in which I can borrow against to go and accommodate that need for capital, but my cash continues to grow in a compounding uh, fashion for the rest of my life. So now I not only have the real estate asset, I also have my cash growing in an uninterrupted manner. And so it's just taking your cash and giving it multiple jobs instead of trading it for that, that one real estate asset. So I don't know if that helps, <laughs> but that's another way to think about, uh, you know, what Russ's story was of his family and how they're using it and then how a real estate investor can ac accomplish the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Th thank you for explaining that. And, and the, the illustration of, uh, you know, your wife borrowing the money from within the family is very, very helpful too. And I, you know, so when I first came across the infinite banking concept, I like to think I'm a pretty sharp guy, but it, I had to really process, I had to read that book at least twice and really step back. I asked a million questions to really understand it, but it was what you just hit on in there at the end, Joey, was that, that idea of that the money could be doing two or three, four things kind of at the same time creating insurance, um, generating a return, being something you could borrow against without um, depleting you know, the return. That was actually the, the person who explained it to me. He said, well, imagine you have $100,000 in an account and it's earning you know, 3% interest and then you, you borrow 60,000 of it out. Now you only have 40,000 earning that 3% interest. And he said, in this case, you know, you, you could borrow against and collab, you know, use that as collateral, but you're still earning the interest effectively on the hundred thousand dollars. And that, that concept finally kind of cemented it, uh, for me, but it is, it does take a little bit of time, I think, and energy to wrap, you know, one's head around that, especially because it, it kind of seems like an insurance concept to begin with. And then after a while you you realize it's not really an insurance concept. It's, there's a tool in there that's an insurance policy, but it's really, but it's really not. And I can say like when I, I make my deposits for my annual premiums and then I'm borrowing a large part of that back on a pretty continuous basis and I'm using it like a revolving line of credit. And that's extremely, extremely useful to me as a real estate entrepreneur. Well, and what you just said there too, I think one of the things you mentioned earlier on is that your show is, is helping people, you know, find and buy real estate without realtors. Right. Uh, buy real estate without banks. And one of the reasons why we like to do that is the ease of transactions. And I think that's one of the things that most of the real estate investors that we deal with come back to us and say, oh, wow. So you mean when I borrow, borrow money from these insurance companies, I don't have to fill out hundreds of pages of paperwork? <laughs> There's literally like one or two signatures that, that says how much I want and where I want it directed to? And then the, the next thing we hear from our real estate investors is, you mean I don't have a required payment every month? You know, because there's situations where some people are flipping houses and, and, and they're doing that renovation. And obviously they're trying to, to turn it around as fast as possible. But the carrying cost of that money and, and, the, and, the, and the need to have to make monthly payments on it gets expensive. And that becomes a burden. That becomes a part of that stress that we were talking about earlier. And as you know, Jeff, these insurance companies don't have a required monthly payment due. And that freedom is, I, we, we, we call infinite banking and real estate investing peanut butter and jelly a lot because <laughs> they seem to go so well together. I mean, really any food analogy works for Joey. He likes to eat, but it, it, is, <laughs> it is definitely a win. And, and those are the things that we see is, yes, there's a lot of little working parts in there. As you said, we only feel like this is a tool on our bigger step. This is just a place where we store cash. We ultimately got to get that cash to work. And if it doesn't work yeah. well for us, it won't matter where we put it initially. But if it's just adding and improving the efficiency of everything we do over, over our lifetime, it can be a real significant game changer. Yeah. yeah. I, I've never, Jeff, I've never had somebody um, say, man, Joey, there's just no way you could improve my checking account. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I love my checking account. I mean, I would go to, I would go to blows over this thing. Mm -hmm. No, they, everybody knows if you have a bunch of cash sitting in the bank, you just know you're going backwards, right? Mm -hmm. Inflation 
it's not a good place to store cash, but it's really been the only option that we've ever known about. And so all this is, is an alternative that gives us more of the characteristics that we would want if we knew it existed. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'll tell you, if I, if I never fill out another bank loan application, <laughs> it'll be too soon, you know? And, yes. and so I love that about things like seller financing, which we talk about a lot on the show. And yeah, my experience too, it's, yeah, two, two, a phone call, two quick signatures, and three days later, you know, the ACH in my bank account of these loan loan proceeds, they 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 don't have the ability to say no. They don't have the inclination to say no. It just doesn't show up on a credit report. Um, I will say one thing that was funny about that idea of there's no no payments are due is maybe three years ago or so I, I was applying for a bank loan and you know as, as they do, they're scrutinizing the heck out of everything. And they're looking at a bank statement and they see a deposit for, I don't know, $20,000 or something. And they're like, what is that deposit? I said, Oh, that was, you know, a loan against my life, my life insurance. And they're like, well, what are the payments on that? Cause we have to factor that into your debt to income ratio. And I was like, there's no, there's no payments on that. And they're like, what do you mean? There's no payments. I mean, I, I mean, I, I don't have to make payments on it. I don't, it, it was just totally over their head. And, uh, but I love those things when you can just do do something that's not it's not really terribly complicated. It's just not super mainstream, and that it kind of blows the mind of everybody else around you. I feel that way a lot about seller financing in general. But a great a great great tool. Yeah, yeah that's a good point that you're making. Is that um, a lot of people hear this concept and they're like, "Wait a minute, that's 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 you know." off the beaten path. I'm not sure if I can trust it, kind of this type of thing. But it's exactly what you said. When you're playing in a real estate entrepreneurial mindset, you are you have to be thinking outside of the box, right? The best deals come to those who can solve the problem in a way that nobody else can think of, right? Yeah. And so uh, I love the idea that you call this thoughtful real estate because it is you're literally applying some of the the concepts and ideas that are totally uncommon, but create amazing uh, optimization of a business or or cash flow or, or fill in the blank. Yeah, absolutely. So, could you take a minute before we wrap up to tell everybody kind of about your community? And if if I recall correctly, there is some uh, infinite banking education within that that they might be might be interested in learning about. Yeah, so our, uh, actually, if it's all right, we'll give away a, a free link to it, so that way your your team um, and people who are listening can, can be a part of it. So if you Wonderful. go to wealthwhitewallstreet.com forward slash tree, right? So that's for thought for real estate entrepreneurs, right? And th- there'll be a link there. You can join the community. And there's about 3,500 people across the country that are, are members in it. And what we love about this community is not only have we taken the time, like you said, Jeff, to create courses on deeper subjects like the infinite banking concept. So if you go to courses, once you join, you, you can see IBC 101, that's infinite banking concept. And you can get five to, you know, seven minute videos that will break this down in a way that you should be able to understand and obviously apologize in advance for the rednecks teaching the course, but <laughs> we, we tried to, our best to draw enough pictures in there to help compensate for our lack of communication skills. <laughs> But also inside of this community, we've built it for group collaboration, for there to be a, a thoughtful process for when people are there that they can ask questions of other people on the same journey. And that's so important because we, we, we can go on journeys solo, but we get so much further when we go together. And we believe that people who have a like mind, um, like, like-minded objective can ask other people on that and be inspired and encouraged because not always are the people we're hanging out with necessarily daily are on that same journey. And so we've built this community with that in mind. You can go to social media anywhere and you can get cat memes and political humor and everything else. But <laughs> we, we decided we'll leave all of that for Facebook and Instagram and parlor or whatever. We'll, we'll keep this focused on the journey of obtaining our time back and becoming financially free and so as you're in there, not only can you get tactics and get access to some of the experts that we interview on our podcast, but also you can message anyone are in there to help kind of give direction and uh, answer questions as well. Yeah, that is great. Well, thank you so much. Can you, would you mind giving us the, the link just one more time? 
Yeah, it's uh, wealthwithoutwallstreet.com forward slash tree, T-R-E-E for thoughtful real estate entrepreneurs. Oh, that is so cool. Thank you for setting that up. We really, really appreciate that. And then people should check out your podcast also called Wealth Without Wall Street, right? That's yeah. right. Yeah, okay. Please. Okay. Wonderful. Well, guys, thank you so much for taking the time to, uh, to, to be on the show and share your story and, and your perspective and these, these awesome financial tools you're using. And thank you so much for the offer to let us join in your community. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having us on the show. All right. Take care. Well, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed that interview. A couple really nice, fun guys to be around and really a a wealth, no pun intended. Well, maybe a little bit of a pun intended wealth of information about financial independence and different and cool ways to get there. And I hope that you are intrigued by this idea of infinite banking as well. I also hope you are heading over to wealthwithoutwallstreet.com slash tree right away as well, because you do not want to miss that generous offer that they shared with us. Well, that is it for today's episode of Racking Up Rentals. So again, show notes, including a full transcript of this interview, are going to be at thoughtfulre.com slash E57. Please do us a big favor by hitting the subscribe button in your podcast app. And if you would take just a second and rate and review the show, you know, it doesn't have to be a a Shakespearean level uh, review, but if you just put a few words in there about what you find with the show, what you get out of it, we would so be grateful for that. Hey, did you also know that we've got a Facebook group for thoughtful real estate entrepreneurs as well? We do. It is called Rental Portfolio Wealth Builders. We'd love to have you join us there. So just type in the words group dot thoughtful re dot com and we will redirect you right there if you like the episode please take a screenshot of it and post that to instagram if you could tag us on instagram we are at thoughtful real estate all nice and spelled out that would be fantastic too well i will see you in the next episode until then this is jeff from the thoughtful real estate entrepreneur i appreciate you very much and i'm signing off Thanks for listening to Racking Up Rentals, where we build long-term wealth by being win-win deal makers. Remember, solve the person to unlock the deal and solve the financing to unlock the profits. Mm-hmm.